Good evening, everyone. My name is Kyle Ligon, and I will be your host tonight for the first ever webinar, Living with Spinal Cord Injury, Technology, Therapy, and Trends. Now, we have a handful of guests that I have the honor of having on our show tonight. Um, they include a physical therapist, a doctor, a founding member and president of a nonprofit organization that you can't wait to hear about, and an actress slash motivational speaker. Um, just to throw out there right off the bat, we would love your input coming in from home, uh, you, the viewers. If you have a question at any time at all during the show, please submit your questions. Um, and if we don't, by the end of the webcast, um, we will contact you via email post-show. Um, to jump right into it, this is going to be a short video of a little overview of what my story is. Growing up in a small town full of blue collar workers, taught me from an early age that nothing in life is ever handed to you. If you want something, you go and get it, period. I took that hard working pays off mentality and applied it to everything I did in life, especially with sports. I recently surpassed my ninth anniversary where I sustained a spinal cord injury playing freshman football when I was only 14. You know, it's funny. Over the years, I've come to the realization that an individual can do a hundred good deeds, but will always be remembered by their one mistake. Well, I'm here today to tell you that I am not defined by my injury, and that I am more than just a kid that got hurt playing football. I have overcome more things in my 23 years in this world than most people can do in 23 lifetimes. After putting in thousands of hours of therapy, I was able to walk for my senior night and my commencement in high school. I graduated college last May with a major in criminal justice and a minor in sociology, and my latest accomplishment is I am now a spokesperson for one of the top furniture manufacturing companies in the world. I surrounded myself with a great support system. I come from a town that I love and in return loves me back. And I have been blessed with an incredible opportunity that allows me to make a difference in people's lives. I believe one of the saddest things in life is a waste of talent. We're rather too many people taking too much for granted. Not that life is ever guaranteed, which is why you should always appreciate what you do have. You may think I'm crazy for saying this, but through my eyes, I am beyond lucky. The way I see it is that the only disability in life is just a bad attitude. I believe the reason people give up so easy is because they tend to look at how far they still have to go instead of how far they have gotten. I had a former teacher in high school once tell me that the brick walls you encounter in life aren't there to keep you out. They're there to show you how badly you want something. They're there to keep the other people out, not you. Will Smith said it best. He said that if you're not making someone else's life better, then you're just wasting your time. Your life will become better by making other lives better. And that's what I plan on doing every day. My life's been one of the wildest roller coaster rides you can ever imagine. But with all the blood, the sweat, and the tears over the past nine years, one thing I've learned is that life isn't just a straight path. To have the ups, you have to have the downs, or else the ups will feel as high. I've come a long way on this road journey, and I have an even longer way to go. But one thing is for sure, I'm enjoying every step of the way. Now, as I mentioned in the video, um, it was 10 years ago since I've been hurt. Um, in the beginning, it's just been uh, an uphill battle. Um, I was barely even able to pick up my arms up over my head when I was in ICU for 13 days in Philadelphia. And then I got transported here to Allied Services where I did my rehab, where I would then meet uh, Gina Tomasoni as my physical therapist. Um, to give you a little background on myself, where I'm at today is I am, a, as I mentioned again, I'm a spokesperson for quantum rehab. Um, part of my newest development is that I helped along with other consumer advocates for the company, um, our newest technology in eye level. And our, I work on our marketing department, which entails a lot of traveling the country. Um, so for instance, I was just in Boston and get insight and that information of our new technology of what's out there and what eye level can do as far as keeping up with the speed and the height of everyday life with everyone. Um, in it's been a long journey. Um, I have a lot of doctors and therapists to thank since that day. And one that one name that sticks out or one person that comes to mind the most um, through all this over the past decade uh, has been Dr. Gina Tomasoni. And 
it's my pleasure to welcome her on our show tonight as our first guest. So thank you, Gina, for Thanks taking for the time out. Um, yeah. Now, for those of you who don't know, me and Gina go way back, uh, right from the beginning, since a young 14-year-old kid, very immature and uh, arrogant and, <laughs> and hard, hard-headed, very hard-headed. But uh, we made it work. So we don't really know who you are. Um, give them a little background about yourself and what made you um, go into the physical therapy field. Okay. Um, like Kyle said, I am a physical therapist at Ally Services Rehab Hospital, and I've been a therapist there for 22 years now. Um, I started uh, right out of college and was uh, thrown onto the spinal cord unit. Um, I didn't know that was going to be my love for treating spinal cord patients, but I soon developed a, a passion for that. Um, went on to um, become a program manager of the spinal cord unit, and um, I mostly see spinal cord patients now when they come into allied services. Okay, so you mentioned about working with a lot of spinal cord patients. Mm -hmm. um, what does physical therapy do for someone who just doesn't want to do it, if they're lazy, they don't think it's going to work for them? What Touch on the importance of how much of an impact physical therapy plays in the role um, of someone who just sustained a spinal cord injury. I think one of the most vital roles for the physical therapist is to educate the patient on exactly what has happened. Um, when you get a spinal cord injury, as you know, it's a life-changing event for not only you, but your family, your friends, the whole community. So I think um, the biggest part of educating the patient allows them to then buy into what they can still attain, um, why physical therapy is so important in helping to attain those goals, and what still is possible um, after spinal cord injury. What would you say is the average age of a person that you see um, with a spinal cord injury? And in our area here in northeastern Pennsylvania, it's probably a little bit older than um, the average national. We have a highly geriatric population, so probably the average age of our patient we see at Allied is between 55 and 65 um, with various ages sprinkled in. Um, as you know, we were 14 when you got injured, so we see patients as young as 14. Uh, we got patients who are in their mid to upper 80s um, that could attain yeah, Which I did not know until recently that Allied doesn't see anybody younger than 14 um, for a patient. 14 for inpatient, yes. Yeah. And then we have a pediatric outpatient department. Okay, um, so how commonly would you say that you have seen or treated someone similar with my condition on a daily basis? Um, spinal cord injury is actually pretty um, popular. That's the word you want to use in this, in this uh, area. Mm -hmm. People can get a spinal cord injury not only from trauma, like you did, but also from disease processes. So um, do I see a lot of young football players as patients? Not necessarily. But do I see a variety of patients from a variety of mechanisms of injury? Yes. So it could be trauma from football um, or a sports related injury it could be motor vehicle accident it could be a fall down the stairs um, it could be a patient who might have had a stroke with their spinal cord or a tumor pressing on their spinal cord so there's various mechanisms of injury um, but they all fall into um, that spinal cord injury terminology now, i want you to take your time with this next question because um, i just want to know what would you say would be from a therapist perspective Make it uh, the most difficult thing of our time together since everything was so luxurious yours and my time together yes, yes. wow um, probably the fact you were a teenager um, I think that was a huge adjustment for you um, to be first of all in the hospital second of all to be in the hospital with a lot of older patients yep. <laughs> um, you actually were there at a time where we had some younger patients, but more teenagers who didn't want to talk to each other necessarily or share share stories. Uh, so I think you were very um, bullheaded, um, very focused on what you wanted to attain, but yet not willing yet to accept maybe what happened to you. And I know you and I have talked about there kind of was that one day where it kind of hit you. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to be in a wheelchair. To touch base on that, um, really quick. Once I got hurt, the like the doctor told me alone, like you broke your neck. I'm thinking, okay, no big deal. I'll throw a brace on. You go to school the next day. Uh, I didn't realize the severity of my injury, and even when I was an ally, I mean, I knew I couldn't move my legs and stuff. But 
it still doesn't register until um, we had a family meeting and my mother was bringing uh, a whole bunch of close family members to come. And I was thinking like, why do they have to come to this type right. of meeting? And she right. said, well, I had to handle the wheelchair and stuff like that. And that's when I, like, I lost it for like the first time. Uh, I mean, we all have those days, but that's when it really hit me like, oh, it's not just temporary. Right. Like there's no on and off switch. It's just going to be a longer road. So I, I think that probably from that point, you became a little bit, to use your terminology, difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that allowed you to start to understand your injury yeah. a little bit better, um, which helped us to prioritize what we needed to do to get you home and to get you to that next level of care. So um, maybe it was difficult, but it was necessary and helpful at the same time. So going, uh, I'll jump a few questions ahead um, since you just mentioned it. For someone who just sustained a spinal cord injury, um, they're basically really learning how to live in an entirely right. new body. So how do you go about making a certain like workout or plan for their therapy session, given um, their immobility at some parts or impairments? Um, so how do you go about making for each individual? Patient? So each individual is very different. Mm -hmm. um, everyone presents differently. So we do an initial evaluation. Uh, we look at what are your impairments, what deficits do you have, um, what's the complete or incompleteness of your injury, and we establish a plan of care from there. So our goal is to maximize your level of independence as an individual based on what function you have or what function we feel you will get back um, while you're there at Allied. Again, while you're there as an inpatient at Allied, as you know, those are very short-term goals. Um, that rehab on the inpatient level is just only the beginning that you're in rehab for a very long journey after that. So we try to prioritize what are our short-term goals, what are long-term goals, what are future goals. We also look at what are your work goals um, for you getting back to school. So we try to look at the whole person. Um, it's not only physical therapy, but occupational therapy, psychology, rehab nursing, we have social work. So we have a whole team approach um, to help the individual and your family to get back on track, so to speak. So would you say more of a marathon, not a sprint? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, being a physical therapist in an inpatient facility, as you mentioned, um, what are the expectations for a patient given only limited amount of time? Um, right. And it, it's got to be hard on the patient and also yourself because if they're not ready, but right. then they're getting discharged regardless. Um, so basically, how do you know when you're doing all of these therapy sessions um, when your patient is strong enough or what is the turning point where you see that? they can progress to something more difficult that will help them in the long run when they get discharged. Um, well, as you mentioned, inpatient rehab, especially these days, is very limited time-wise. Um, patients aren't with us a very long time, so typically when we're preparing for discharge, the patient and the family might be a little bit awestruck. Yep. I can't believe it's time to go home already. You have this entire life-changing event happen, and we're already talking about preparing you for home in that first week. Um, so unfortunately, with a lot of restrictions these days with insurance companies and just the way healthcare is, our goal on the inpatient side is to prepare the patient and the family to go home so they can move on to that next level of care. Um, so like I said earlier, it's a lot of patient family education and training. Um, so not only do we look to when are you medically stable to go home, which Dr. Wolf will address in a little while, we look at what physical skills do you and your family need to accomplish together to succeed in your home. So we want to make sure that you're safe, that you have a way of mobility, that you can handle a bowel and a bladder program, that you know how to do skin checks, for example. So there's kind of a checklist, so to speak, of things we go through as a team that we know will help you and your family succeed at home, and we try to have you and your family demonstrate those back to us while you're there as an inpatient. So you might tell me on the first day, <clears throat> my goal is to walk with braces and a walker. <clears throat> so I would tell you, Kyle, you know, you're not, maybe we're not going to accomplish that in the first three or four weeks of inpatient rehab. That might be a long-term goal. Let's work together to see what are the goals we need to do right. to get you home safely, what equipment do we need to order, what kind of training do we need to do uh, to help you succeed at home. And then uh, for myself, I uh, included not only as much physicality as it was to it, but then also making sure you're able to go home. But once you get home, are you able to 
still live in that same facility or if Absolutely. there's any accommodations that you have to do right. with extra luggage that you're bringing along right. um, with right. you once you get discharged Absolutely. too. Absolutely. So there's a lot of preparation um, before the patient goes home. And we do a lot of drills, so to speak, um, to prepare you for home. So making sure they're prepared. How many sessions would you say on average? Uh, I know every case is different, but um, the average for a spinal, someone with a spinal cord injury, how many sessions would you say they get a week and how long do they normally Last well, on the inpatient side, we're under uh, very, um, I don't want to say restrictions, but there are very specific rules and regulations for you to come to an inpatient rehab hospital. You have to get therapy, you have to be able to tolerate therapy daily, um, or at least Monday through Friday. So we say five out of seven days a week, you will get therapy for three hours a day total. That's between physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, if you need it. Um, so at minimum, patients are getting five out of seven days of therapy. Um, as far as their length of stay, length of stay might be dictated by their level of injury. So patients could be with us anywhere from two weeks to maybe four to six weeks, again, depending on insurance restrictions, level of injury, and what type of support mm -hmm. system they have at home. Um, so one of the last questions, I want to wrap it up and then we can turn it to our viewers at home, um, is that in, even in the decade, um, not only with phones or wheelchairs, but just the technology um, for the equipment that you use in therapy. What would you say that you primarily use now, really have a decade ago when I was one of your patients? Um, it's funny with spinal cord injury because on the inpatient side, a lot of times you go you go back to basics. Um, a view of a map, <laughs> and you know you have a, a transfer board mm -hmm. and. Uh, you don't always need fancy equipment to accomplish significant functional goals. Um, there are a lot of new things out there on the market. Um, you know, there's a lot of body weight support systems for gait training that maybe some of the viewers have seen. Now is robotics and exoskeletons that are helping patients mm -hmm. to get up and walk. Um, a lot of continued um, so different types of FES bikes, um, they're doing some implantable electrical stimulation these days. So there's always something out there, um, not necessarily appropriate for every patient. I think sometimes a lot of fancy things to accomplish significant goals. There are a lot of exciting things out there to pursue. So going off that, would you, you notice an improvement of patients that you've had who use this technology that maybe their stay wasn't as long 10 years ago than it is today or it, it just varies depending on no i don't person. feel like anything out there has improved our outcomes on an inpatient side um, i think what determines a good outcome from the inpatient side is good family friend community support um, patients that have family to go home to people that come in and participate in their care and are willing to help them get through the hard time, I think are the patients that do the best over any type of body weight support system or exoskeleton out there. Okay, well, Gina, thank you for coming in today and taking the time out of your busy schedule. I mean, I'm sure I can speak for everyone at home that um, none of us would be where we are today had it not been for people like you, our therapists. So, um, look, just because you are living with a spinal cord injury has to stop you from living your life to the fullest. Coming up after the break, we will meet an individual who enables and empowers people to do just that. Um, but first, we are going to take a short break um, with a video from our uh, supporting partners.
Welcome back. Again, um, if you guys have any questions at all, please submit them. We will answer them live here on air. Um, if you end up having a question that we don't get to, we will gladly respond um, via email or get back to you some way, shape, or form afterwards. But right now, I just want to welcome Joe Salva, who is the founding member and the president of the nonprofit organization based here in Northeastern Pennsylvania, which is called I Am. So Joe, thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for having me, Todd. Absolutely, um, it's our pleasure. So Joe, for the viewers at home, just uh, tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and a little bit about your background and um, your, a little bit more about your story that people don't know about. Okay, well, I'm 38 years old and uh, I happen to have a spinal cord injury, uh, C5, C6, um, complete injury. Uh, it happened when I was 26 years old, so a little bit over 12 years ago. Um, uh, it was a work-related injury. Uh, I happened to fall off a roof. Uh, I was in the construction field. And uh, as you know, um, went through all the traditional rehab, um, yes. inpatient, outpatient. All the fun stuff. Yes, it's all fun stuff. Uh, and uh, had a lot of uh, wonderful experiences. Not all of them wonderful experiences, but um was lucky to meet some great people along the way and uh it has definitely changed the direction of my life but uh currently um as you had said um we uh was a founding member of uh individual abilities in motion or i am and then currently serving as the president of that organization well first of all that's great and before we get to that i just want to I, I want to try to kind of get inside your head first. I mean, as I, we talked with and discussed with Gina earlier, every individual, every patient is different from the next. Um, one person would be very outgoing, doing a webcast like this. Others would be locking themselves in the room. So for yourself personally, like you said, it happened 12 years ago. Um, what was, you say, the hardest challenge that you had to face um, living in this new world, so to speak? Well, um, as you know, there are a lot of different challenges, and I think that uh, on some level, I still meet those challenges on a daily mm -hmm. basis. Um, I'm not sure if I can identify the hardest challenge. Um, what I would say for myself is actually time. Time, time is the hardest challenge for me. Um, everything with the spinal cord injury tends to take longer, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that time really does add up through the course of the day and, and I, I definitely feel myself um, wishing I could get more done in the, in the course of the I day. Never thought about it like that. So, so time really is probably my biggest challenge. Time is on the essence. Yes. <laughs> but to go off of, of that question is what was the trigger that made you want to create some type of organization that can help people um, similar within your situation um thrive and not be so oh i can't really do this or i can't do that or basically make them look at the glass like oh like i can i can do that and just because i'm in a chair it shouldn't prevent me from living my life and i go about that. i think to answer that question that there would be two things that really helped uh, push me in that direction um one i was fortunate that um fortunate um, that my injury was work related. So I, I have workman's comp, which um, covers a little bit more from the insurance perspective. So I was able to have a slightly longer stay in, in inpatient rehab, and I didn't have to necessarily face some of the hurdles that I, I noticed other people with spinal cord injuries um, having to deal with. So, so in some sense, it's been a little bit easier for me to get some of those things. And, and it really bothered me that I would see other people not reaching their potential because of limitations like that. Right. Not not having yeah. the the rehab stay that where they can maximize Stuff their take for granted, which is crazy to think about. Right, mm -hmm. uh, they just can see that they can get further yeah. if they had more support. I, I was also fortunate to do a portion of my rehab in New York, um, where they have a life a, a program called Life Challenge, and they basically. It's a support group, but it's not a traditional sit around in a circle support group and just no, talk sorry. about things. Yes. They, they're active. They, they do things. They get out there. And I, I thought that was a great model for um, but just a way to offer support. It's through doing things. It's not just um, by sitting there talking about um, 
it's it's moving forward. So you got so it wasn't so much you, it was so much seeing how much of a benefit it worked for other people that you took in consideration that you instead of going to New York for it, you could bring it down somewhere. I, I think it was a uh, a combination of, of knowing that programs existed out there and, and that we can do more in this area. Uh, knowing that there are opportunities for people with spinal cord injuries, um, activities that they can participate in, but unfortunately might not have easy access mm -hmm. to. So we wanted to try and solve that problem in, in this year. So like you said, it's an individual disabilities motion. Right. Um, what exactly does that entail? Well, it's a nonprofit organization, 501c3. We were founded in 2013, um, and, and we kind of already covered why we were created. We, we saw a need that existed and an opportunity to meet that need. So um, we offer currently four different basic um, programs within the organization. We have a, what we call a Get Out, Get Out Active program. That's more of our uh, adventurous activities and social activities. So uh, that program is basically designed to get people doing things instead of just sitting at home and you know, trying to look at what is possible. And those activities can range anywhere from, uh, you know, going to a comedy club or just out to dinner or some more adventurous things like perhaps water skiing or skydiving. Right. <laughs> so it's uh, pretty wild yeah, stuff. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, and we have, uh, you know, peer mentoring group where, where it is more of the traditional um, meeting up with people that are similar level of injuries and uh, sharing stories. Just we, an equal balance between correct. all of them. Correct. Right. So and and we have, we, we definitely try to focus on community awareness um, events and also healthy living opportunities. Absolutely. I mean, all the great stuff, especially for people who are newly injured and even been in a chair for over a decade. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the information is always out there. It, always and, learning new things. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, so, like you were saying, all the different things that you do, they vary. But personally, I don't know if you can put it out there, but what has been your favorite thing that you have done within the group um, since you started? Well, to be honest, the favorite thing for me is really knowing that we're making a difference. When, when we hold an event or have an activity and we really see that we connected with someone or um, helped increase awareness and made things a little bit easier, hopefully in the future, that, that's really my favorite part of being part of this group. But if we're talking about sheerly from an adrenaline standpoint, <laughs> skydiving is yeah, that not. Would you ever do it again? I would do it again. Yes, yes. I, yes. I would do it. <laughs> I would do one more time because it's really it's just an amazing. Experience. So, like you said, with the skydiving and just making a difference in something as extreme as that, or something as maybe doesn't appeal look appealing to just informing someone. But who decides? Do you, as the president, like stomp on the other people, or is it like a collective type? It's not a dictator. Like, um, what comes? Who decides? Like, or how do you come about what's coming up next, or what thing you're going to do? We really try and listen to our members and the people that we're working with. Um, we try and network with people within the group, and you know, put out a survey or listen to input. And and sometimes we get great feedback, and other times um, we might not know exactly what people want to do. So we'll just create an event and put it out there and try and get people interested. And that's great. Well, I'm going to take a quick stop from our little session because Kelly from Texas has to go, how do you focus on empowering others um, with activities you cannot do yourself? That's a, that's a it, pretty good question. Um, Thank you, Kelly, by the way. I, I think that uh, we're having a spinal cord injury, everyone has different levels. Um, so everyone also has different abilities within those levels. And for me, uh, there are activities that I'm not going to necessarily be able to do. I, I, I can't um, for wheelchair basketball. But I think part of empowering other people is, is putting that information out there and letting people know that there are opportunities to do that. And that includes the, the general public as well. Uh, more awareness is key to um, providing people with the opportunities to fulfill their potential. Great, great. Well, even like that CrossFit um, benefit thing that you right. had. Right, we recently had a, uh, a 
a community awareness um, CrossFit event where we had individuals um, within the CrossFit community um, do all of the workouts from a wheelchair perspective. Great for them because that some of our members do CrossFit and it was perfect awareness and they got to see how much different it is the shoes on the when other side. you're sitting the down. On the yes, yes, <laughs> much, much different. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But uh, so what have you not done that um, you would love to try? I think, just talked about? I think scuba diving is on, on, on my list of activities to try. Let's go to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't done that yet as a group, but um, personally I would like to try. It's in the works. Yeah. And great. I mean, for Kelly in Texas and everyone else watching um, across the country, how can someone become a member for AM? Well, we um, it, it's you can go to our website um, and and sign up and join as a member. Um, if you had specific questions, you can always just email me at um, info at individualabilities.org. So, uh, serve as the Northeastern Pennsylvania chapter for United Spinal Association. So through their website as well. So uh, again, for the viewers, would it just be individuals, abilities, emotion? Just give all your information one more time so sure. that they're not confused. I mean, Joe's going to say it now, but um, after this, we're going to have the links all listed um, on our website um, for Joe and all the other of our guests that were here. Today. Our organization's website is uh, www.individualabilities.org. Um, you can send email um, at info at individualabilities.org, or you can find us through uh, UnitedSpinal.org under Northeastern Pennsylvania chapter. Well, thanks again, Joe. I mean, for all the work, hard work that you and your organization does, that um, just because you're in a chair, um, it shouldn't stop you from doing what you want to do and stopping you from getting to your full potential, even though you are limited. Limited, you're not. Limited. I mean, you're there, are, there are limitations, but it, there are still lots of possibilities. I mean, in a sense, you went from crawling to flying um, from skydiving, depending on how you look at it, and it's all great things. Um, definitely go out, check out his website. And again, um, like, thank you, Kelly, again, for submitting your question. Um, floor is always open, like I said before, right from the beginning. Um, there's only a couple more segments left, so if you have any questions, please, um, I can't force them enough, put them in, and or really quick, we're gonna take a short break um, with our sponsors from Quantum Rehab. Welcome back. Unfortunately, Mia um, cannot make it tonight, but she did send in this video for you, the viewers at home, to see. Hey, 
Yes, and I am so glad to be a part of this webinar. I'm actually not live because sometimes technology doesn't always do what we want it to do. But I am traveling right now for my wedding. So I uh, really wish I could be in live, but this is you know the next best thing. And I'm really, really happy to be a part of this program. I think it's very important. I think we have a lot to talk about when it comes to spinal cord injury and the life after spinal cord injury. I do believe that it's a life changer, not a life ender. Um, although, when I first got paralyzed at age 15, I did think it was a life ender. I thought my life was over. I didn't know that I'd be able to go on with my life and and do everything that I had dreamed of and wanted to accomplish, regardless of a wheelchair. When I was um, in high school, I had a stomach ache. I was on the swim team in my high school, but I went to the hospital with a severe stomach ache, and towards the end of the night, realized my legs were really heavy. It wasn't until the next day that they did an MRI, and we found out that there was an AVM, an arterial venous malformation, which is a rare uh, blood vessel in which it was in my spinal cord and it ruptured. When it ruptured, it damaged nerves in the spinal cord, and those don't regenerate. So that's why I ended up with a spinal cord injury. And when they told me I was never going to walk again, I really believed that that was the end of my life. I didn't think I'd ever go in public again. I didn't think I'd ever do sports again. I was very athletic. I was a swimmer. That was a, a big part of my life, and I really thought that I'd never return to any of it. And you know what, about um, a month into my physical rehab, I started to gain strength, not only physical strength, but mental strength, and started to realize that my life wasn't over and that there were all these things I could do, and if I didn't do them the same, I could still do them, but maybe differently. And the ways that I started going back to things, and even if it was different in the way I did it, I actually enjoyed it in a whole new way because I had already done them one way, and it was interesting to find out how to do something in a different way. So I learned to embrace the challenges of learning a life all the way over in, uh, by using a wheelchair, and I learned to really um, appreciate the problem-solving aspect of it. I never feel that I'm ever stuck or that, um, that I can't move my life forward because I do believe that a lot of it is is a mental attitude and I never let anything make me feel like I can't do something if I uh, might not be able to do it the way I thought I would be able to do it I can always find a way to do something and that's why I don't feel disabled and I don't feel paralyzed I do feel that I can accomplish anything I want regardless of being paralyzed or in a wheelchair Okay. I really felt like it was important to also spread that message to people not only in wheelchairs, but people that have never experienced somebody that is um, dealing with spinal cord injury or dealing with someone they know that has spinal cord injury. So when I was in the hospital, I actually looked up the TV one day and I was like, I really wish there could be somebody on TV or somebody that was in the media that could make me feel that, you know, wow, like if they can do it, I can do it, and that they would be somewhat of a role model. Uh, so I kind of, you know, thought that I had that moment when I was in the hospital, and then thought, well, maybe I could, could get the opportunity to do that someday. So fast forward all these years, I, um, I in between I went to college, University of Florida, I majored in uh, TV and film production, and then I moved out to Los Angeles, and I started working in uh, the recording industry, and then went on to graphic design, and then I found myself uh, meeting all these new people, and I never really had friends in wheelchairs before, but when I went out there, I met these great people, including these three other girls named Angela, Otti, and Tiffany, and we became friends, fast friends, um, mostly because of our uh, attitude, we just kind of bonded, and then uh, when we started kind of wanting to get together and, and advocating for positivity within spinal cord injury, we were approached to do a show, and that show is Push Girls. And so some of you may have seen it, some of you may have not, but uh, the main goal in that show was to show the public that the wheelchair is the least of our worries in our lives because we really are just people at the end of the day dealing with the same things everybody else is dealing with. And if we show the world that we're just people too, maybe sitting down, then they will not have fear about disability anymore and they will not feel the need to, um, to shut it or to, 
to not embrace it and to not embrace inclusion. So the show was very successful and we had a great time doing it. We um, still are working on some new projects, so stay tuned and to our social media and stuff. And I am really just excited about what's happening right now in the world of spinal cord injury and inclusion. I think that we're just hitting the surface when it comes to getting recognized and also showing people that there's nothing that we can't do. And I really want to continue to be an advocate for that and also encourage others to as well. I think it makes a big difference not only in our own personal lives, but also in the mainstream um, society. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to touch base on, uh, I know that you're going to be seeing a video right after this about me getting back in the pool. As I mentioned before, I was a swimmer when I was 15 and got paralyzed. And I did go back to so many of the activities I did before that included um, basketball and uh, water sports and um, even academics, just, just going back into my life. But the one thing I left behind at the time was swimming. And I didn't realize that it was uh, an emotional boundary that was keeping me from doing that again until years and years later i knew that i was able to swim i was told that but for some reason i just didn't want to and i wasn't ready 17 years after that after i had the last swam i got back in the pool again and push girls was able to capture that moment it was a very special moment for me and i am so glad that it's actually documented because it was a big milestone in my life i had you know had this fear i think that there would be a huge aspect of swimming that would make me feel like I was limited and that there was something that I was afraid to deal with after you know my life before and my after so when I got back in the pool and started swimming all of that fear melted away in fact after all the other times I had done a swim meet and you know won first place and had ribbons this time I felt like a true winner more so than all those other times. It was a, a sense of winning for me inside, internally, and I realized that at that point, there was nothing that was ever gonna stop me. So, you know, here I am 17 years later, uh, you know, still overcoming some milestones when it comes to uh, spinal cord injury, but that just goes to show you that life is still throwing challenges challenges and I'm still happy to embrace them and still excited to grow and continue to grow and that I am really excited to see what's around the corner and to continue on my journey and also um, I want to also encourage you guys to continue on your journey and if you ever have any questions or um, just even want to throw a shout out to me please reach out to me i have social media my facebook is my name um, but i will spell it for you because it's very long so my first name mia is very easy it's short m-i-a and my last name shikwitz s-c-h-a-i-k E W I T Z. So Mia Shikwitz is my name on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and also I have a website and it's called sincerelymia.com. You can email me through my website and I would really love to hear from you. So please don't hesitate with any comments or questions and enjoy the, re the rest of the webinar and hopefully I will meet you all in person someday too. Okay, thank you. Bye. Los Angeles is a big city, but somehow by fate we found each other. This is Tiffany, Mia, Ati, and I'm Angela. I'm a push girl, and this is how we roll. Within seconds, my whole life changed. I was paralyzed from the neck down. I was hit in a head on vehicle collision. I was just growing into myself. The doctor said you'll never walk her down to get. They pronounced everyone dead on scene, including myself. I didn't have an accident. For me, it was like my own body turned on me. I think the hardest thing about being a wheelchair is other people's perception. We may be defined, but we are not confined by our wheelchairs. I'll see his marriage to this beautiful man, Eric. You know, my biological work is to get my you know, baby, now. I found my soulmate. I miss you, babe. In some ways, I think the accident saved you. I'm proud of you. I love you.
today I'm going to try to swim for the first time in 17 years. I've been wanting to do this for so long, but I keep hesitating because I was afraid I was going to lose my enjoyment from it. If I lost my enjoyment from it, I'd feel like getting paralyzed took something away from me. If my challenge was to be in a wheelchair for life, I wouldn't make it a hindrance and keep me from doing things I wanted to do. I need to try this because it could be something. Putting my feet in the water was weird because I couldn't feel it. I didn't know if it was going to be cold or hot. I think I'm afraid of feeling weak and feeling limited and feeling trapped. I didn't know if I'd make it, but once I did, I was really happy. It's like, okay, this is doable. I knew at that moment that I was back. Woo! We are the group of four women coming together, embracing a catastrophic event and turning tragedy into triumph. Having a strong friendship with the girls is everything. Thank you for being here and being in my life. We are so strong individually, so together that just makes it even more like dynamite. On September 12, 2006, I sustained a spinal cord injury playing football. I was life rider to Philadelphia, then later was transferred to Highlight Rehab, where I was inpatient for eight weeks. She kept giving me things to do and just constantly kept getting better. That's uh, why I believe that I've gotten to a certain point where I am now, and uh, so progressively getting better. They've, they've been so welcoming and caring and so supportive. Um, it's just remarkable. <laughs> On September 12, 2006. Welcome back, everyone. Um, before I get to Dr. Walt, we had a question submitted in by Clinton. Clinton Green. Um, Clinton, we don't know where you're watching from, but in this, well, Clinton wants to know about your the unit that you're using. Was that your first uh, mobility device? And is there anything that you would change about your your choices and device? It was. Um, I was with a Permobile C300 in the beginning um, for a couple of years, but um, just personal preference uh, and lack of keeping up with the maintenance of it, not from myself, but just not having equipment that lasted as long as it should have. Uh, I just wasn't pleased with it. So that made me go to um, this Q6 Edge, and this is the newest one, with, as I talked on before with the eye level technology. Um, I wouldn't do go anywhere else besides this. Um, it enables me to do everything from grocery shopping, uh, as I'm sure you saw in the clips that we had earlier, um, to just even cooking in my house, grabbing clothes out of the closet, just not having to rely so dependently on other people. And it gives me um, more free range to do things on my own instead of being needy. And it's been very empowering um, since. But thank you for submitting your questions. Dr. Wolf, thank you for uh, coming on and being our, the, the honor of being our last guest of the night for our first ever wetcast. Um, Dr. Wolf, for those who don't know, is the medical director of the Spinal Cord Injury Unit here at Allied Services um, based in Scranton, Pennsylvania. So, doctor, um, what would you say your role, uh, obviously you have a number of it, but to sum it up, what is your role for the spinal cord injury unit? Well, my role is really to treat patients and advise the team. Uh, part of the team, it's like any other team. You play sports, uh, it's uh, any other integral piece. Uh, we have uh, excellent program managers. Uh, you met Gina earlier today. Um, and my role is to uh, help from the medical aspect of it. What has been over your the course and all of your experience the most challenging part of your job? I would say the most challenging part of my job at this point is besides this. 
Yeah, <laughs> this is easy. <laughs> it's 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 getting what I and the team want for our patients. Um, accessibility has become difficult, difficult to access inpatient rehab. It's difficult to access outpatient rehab therapies. Uh, getting insurance to cover um, uh, the needs. This is, as you said earlier, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. Uh, individuals require uh, therapy that go on for at least a year or two. Um, the changes are small but significant over a period of time. Uh, getting funding for equipment that's necessary. Household changes, environment changes. Um, that access to the funding that's necessary to help individuals is probably the most challenging part. Other little things people don't necessarily think about until it's too late kind of thing, and it's them that's in that position. And 40 years ago, I would say patients who were in a similar situation as you could stay in inpatient rehab for a year and get all their inpatient you rehab. You love that. Um, <laughs> now we are um, really down to about three to six weeks, depending on you know what the individual uh, injury is and what the different uh, medical conditions correlated with that are. And it's really about preparing them as a transition between their acute hospital stay and being able to get to the next level of care. And our goal uh, is trying to help the patient's goal of trying to continue their rehab at home. And there are a lot of barriers to try and overcome in order to do that. Some of them are environmental barriers, some are medical barriers, some are whether or not the individual has a supportive family and friends to be able to, to help them. But that's really our goal is to set the game plan. <laughs> it's like the preseason, if you will, uh, to set the uh, game plan for the rest of the season. Yeah, except people are watching this. <laughs> but um, on the flip side of that, what would you say would be the most rewarding just after all that's going through, I guess, meeting all those requirements, would you say, or is it something completely different? So in the field of rehabilitation medicine, uh, it's different than other fields of medicine. Other fields of medicine are about diagnosing a, an illness, a disease, and treating it. Um, in this situation, in rehab medicine, it's treating the disabilities and handicaps that can come from that injury. Many times I can't necessarily cure the illness, um, but it's curing, if you will, the disabilities or the handicaps that come from it. And so the most rewarding part is being able to see those things happen. So, you know, to make it personal, getting down to seeing a 14-year-old who was injured playing football and be able to overcome that barrier and move forward with the motivation and the ability to graduate high school, go on to college, go on to having his own one hour webinar and educating other uh, individuals. That's, that's, that's a success. <laughs> As you just touched on it a little bit on the end of that, how do you yourself, I should ask Gina earlier, but I'll ask you now, how do you not get so attached to someone who, like you have kids, to someone you can see yourself kind of being one of your own and just being more of on the professional side instead of getting that emotional attachment to a patient? Um, it's difficult, and it is a fine line. Um, I need to maintain my professionalism, um, and, you know, it's almost it's almost the same concept with your own children. You know what? I'm your father. I'm not your friend. I don't want to be friendly with you, but I am still your father. I still have to set the limits. I still have to set the boundaries. And when it comes to my patients, uh, there's also that same kind of fine line. Um, you know, many times, uh, fortunately, I end up having to be the bad guy. I'm the director, I'm the, you know, the, the captain of the ship, if you will, of the team. And when it comes time to tell a patient the difficult things, uh, the no person <laughs> as opposed to the yes person, no, yes, ma um, somebody has to take that role, and that's my role, and I let the team uh, be that realm of the, the, the support otherwise. Now, since the beginning um, of your start here, even at Allen, or just in medicine and rehab in general, uh, the 
the new hypothermic treatment that has just come out a uh, few years ago. Um, what is your take on that? And for the people at home who aren't really activated with that, um, can you touch a little bit on that part of the treatment? Sure. So this is more of an acute care situation, immediate treatment. Um, this came out of, I believe, the Miami Project, uh, and it became publicized. Kevin Everett, who was the uh, professional football player for the Buffalo Bills, uh, and essentially the sideline physician at that time, when the injury occurred, called something that was going on to Miami Project, which was to induce hypothermia. Uh, and the idea of hypothermia, uh, reducing hypothermia, was to slow the swelling phase, the scarring phase down initially. It's not, when, when an injury occurs to the spinal cord, it's not necessarily that initial insult that can be the most damaging. It's the swelling that can occur, the edema that occurs afterwards, and then the scarring that it can occur afterwards was that by inducing hypothermia, you are slowing that whole process down to then try and prevent that edema and prevent that type of swelling and therefore the secondary damage. Have you yourself, any patients, not going into names or anything, um, who had that type of treatment done No, before you? I don't believe that at this point this is uh, considered mainstream uh, type of treatment in the field yet. Okay, okay. Um, so just like a chance in his case that it just happened to work out that way. And we don't know in that situation um, whether or not the hypothermia, the induced hypothermia did or didn't do anything, whether or not if hypothermia wasn't induced, would um, Kevin Evans still, still have the same outcome that he had? And I touched on with Gina earlier. Um, as far as from a therapeutic standpoint goes, um, with the zero Gs and the exoskeletons and that advancement. Um, we have all that stuff out there now. We talked a little bit with Gina earlier that it's good. It, it may advance certain individuals, but overall, like you said, with the hypothermic treatment, it's not for everyone. How, how we've come so far in the past decade since I've been injured. How, where do you see us going in the next five to 10 years as far as treatment goes or equipment for um, more advanced therapy? I believe that functional electric stimulation, whether it be external or implanted, is going to be a key factor. I believe that any type of remodeling of the central nervous system and taking advantage of the what's called neuroplasticity. You know, in the old days, it used to be thought that once you injure the central nervous system, that is the brain or spinal cord, that's it, it's over, it's done, there's nothing you can do. It's not like your skin, when you tear your skin and it regenerates, when you break a bone, it regenerates. The thought was the central nervous system can't regenerate. But we're finding out today that that's not necessarily true. There is this small window of opportunity of what's called neuroplasticity where there may be a chance to uh, have an impact on regeneration. Uh, I was just telling Gina before the show, I was just reading a, a new article about uh, even individuals who are injured uh, for years can have this, what we'll call a neural bridge. And it basically uh, creates new connections if you can tear down some of the scar tissue and help get regeneration. Uh, there's a lot of talk about stem cell research. Um, and I believe if stem cell for the spinal cord injury was ready to go, that you would see a lot more advertisement <laughs> for it. It really hasn't been the utopia that uh, it was at least initially thought to be. That doesn't mean that stem cell doesn't work for certain things, but for spinal cord injury, it's just not there yet. So we've come a long way, but we still have a little bit further more to go. But Dr. Wolf, thank you for taking time out of your schedule and coming to talk to us and all the viewers at home. If you haven't already submitted your questions, please, please do so. Um, our closing ceremony is uh, coming up, and but sit tight. Before then, um, we're going to get a quick word um, from our sponsors at the Paralyzed Veterans Association.
nobody has perfect life. Everybody has their amount they find. And mine's just physical. I had no clue what life was going to be about after I got hurt. When you're fresh in a chair, you're like a newborn baby almost. You have to learn everything all over again. I mean, anybody that plays sports knows what that rush is to get out there and give it your all to fight, fight, fight to try and win a game. Go inside, there's these guys in wheelchairs just beating the crap out of each other. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm playing this. Oh, just because your wheelchair means big. I'm still here. I can do everything. I just do it sitting down. 